Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Brendan Howells with Evoke Bike. We've got Hayden Mitchell, who is a movement educator, which if you don't know what that means, you're going to want to listen to this podcast because we talk about strength and actually what is strength. How does this apply to cycling? And there are some cyclists out there that you might follow on Instagram who works with Hayden. And one of them was talking about how they were interested in restoring natural movement, firing patterns, increasing mobility, and just being more connected to their body and, oh yeah, getting stronger, making more watts. But the conversation just opens up from there and we talk about mind-body techniques and the neurological side and coordination of strength and taking ownership of your training. We could have talked for four hours. We'll have to have Hayden back. But everybody, good luck with your training and racing. Hit up Hayden if you want to have a conversation with him about what he's doing and if it can help you get faster on the bike. Good luck. Talk to you soon. Okay. Yeah. I'm so this is actually a great point to start with the first sort of I want you to introduce yourself but I think one thing that for people when we send them to your Instagram the thing that jumped out to me was movement educator so can you just introduce yourself how do you see Hayden Mitchell and what is a movement educator and we'll kind of jump off from there if that sounds good to you yeah that's great cool hit it all right, so <laughs> Hayden Mitchell, um, I've had a long background in movement of some kind. I started coaching soccer at 16 years old. Man. Um, so 22 years in some level of movement and uh, found that movement was the most common language we speak, really. Uh, and through my experiences as an inner city teacher, where I coached kids from like 27 different nations, I found instead of teaching history, which is what I did for a long time, I could really connect with people on the deepest layer, you know, and I'm obsessed with the human condition and the kind of ecological approach to just human performance. Um, And so there's just like this passion and this love and this intensity and all that came out through movement and it didn't have to be through a certain sport. And so my doctorate, when I finally finish this dissertation, will be in human performance sport pedagogy or sport education. Um, And so I identify myself as a movement educator first. I can be a sports performance coach, a personal trainer, all of those things. Um, But the beautiful part of my life is I've never had to niche down. And I've been able to explore a ton of different methods and modalities and kind of an obsession with motor skill acquisition and obviously motor learning. And we talked about my dad with his strokes, right? It's like, all right, we're playing a motor learning game all day long. Um, But yeah, just the kind of a human first um, approach through through movement. and how does that tie into Wayfinder? The Wayfinder approach? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A Wayfinder came came through um, a lot of the lessons I've learned in life are on hikes and and then climbing mountains. So, um, you know, the Wayfinder came from going through a really difficult time. Uh, I was out in California. I was on a hike. And, um, yeah came across a boulder that had fallen on the trail. It was gnarly. I'm so glad I didn't get crushed. Um, but no one was there that day and it was a pretty wild little thing to do. Um, but I was able to crawl, climb over this boulder and gone through a pretty emotional time. I got to the top of the mountain. There's this panoramic view of ocean, lake, and mountains. Mm. It was stunning. And there's this like single tree at the top of this mountain. And uh, kind of broke down. And I was like, this is why I do what I do, man. This isn't just for me. Like, I help people find their way. Like, no matter the obstacle, like, we can work around, we can work over, we can work through. Um, And so that's how the Wayfinder name was born. And, uh, yeah. So from a coaching standpoint, I thought it was awesome. I can't remember if I read this or heard you say this, but it's it was my way is not yours, but I'll help you find your way. And that was a mic drop because I think that is such a missed aspect of coaching 
that I've received as an athlete or from other coaches that I might work with or newer coaches or whatever. When did you come? When was that like, oh, like I'm not clearly that message. The way I hear that is you're not here to teach me just what you know. You're not here to just program things for me if I was your athlete. But okay, how does Brendan move towards success, whatever that might mean to him? Am I hearing that the right way? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think like we kind of talked about, I think in your 20s, you're kind of a jerk sometimes. Like, you you know, when you're a young man, you're like, this is this is my way. Mm. And I've kind of been talking a lot about this. It's like the, the lack of apprenticeship and mentorship, mm. whether that's from older men or women just being afraid to like ask, you know, and kind of like insert themselves into somebody's life or younger people like, I got this. Um and through a lot of life experiences go, man, I got to a place where I needed mentors and I realized that so many different ways and on some other experiences led me to places like there's so many different avenues to explore and within movement, there's infinite movement problems, infinite movement solutions. And I taught that a lot when I was teaching at the University of Alabama. It's like there's so many ways to explore these different strategies, right? Um, and yeah, within that, it's I can't get obsessed with one way. Once I do that, I go down this deep rabbit hole, and there's not um, there's no soul in it. There's just science a lot of times, and I kind of forget the human being in front of me. Mm. But I have to be really cautious about diving deliberately into research hold is I'll get so obsessed with a metric that I forget this person. Ooh, go in on that because especially, and I want to talk about your involvement in the cycling world. Obviously we're a cycling podcast, but when you say getting too caught up in the metrics, like what, can you give an example of that? Or, or like, can you go in on that a little bit more? Well, I think, you know, we all, as, as sports performance coaches, right? And we can talk about like their, the sort of delineation between like there's a cycling performance and then there's kind of this other person too. I think a lot mm-hmm. of times you probably need that. Um, let's just say like we can get obsessed with the say velocity based training, like VBT. And I need to hit this bar velocity in 1.0 to 1.3 meters a second. And if I don't hit it, something's wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, I do that. I've done that a lot, you know, whether it's an obsession with percentages. We've got to hit 72 to 75.5% load right here to be able to evoke the adaptation that I was hoping for. And I need all of these data points, you know, quantitatively to be able to start to make decisions. And I find that a lot of my cyclists, right, and a lot of my athletes are already so neurotic that that can become problematic too. Mm-hmm. And I think we've engaged, like, it's almost this obsession. We have a lot of podcasts that'll feed into this where it's like there's just this obsession with neuroticism and to create so many different layers of control that you can't really let it go. Mm-hmm. You know, to the point where, you know, Austin and Yoakum actually posted this today. It was kind of funny, but he's talking about the whoop. You know these people too. Wake up, 0% recovery. Absolutely dominate race. Wake up, 99% recovery. Get absolutely destroyed. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think there's a lot of beauty in the the quantitative metrics but a lot of times I'm dealing with psychosocial stuff, you know, and there's a lot more in performance than just that. The, I re, the reason I asked, and I'm glad you brought up cyclists is just in the past, I would say five or maybe 10 years, the obsession within the cycling community of just Watts and numbers is amazing to me. And people just forget that they're, is this chess game that we play if you actually want to win a bike race and tactics and the mental side of things. And it's just so much more 
than watts for performance. And when you say psychosocial, is this just like our confidence? Or when when you bring that up, what are you talking about? <laughs> I think there's probably a lot of stories behind this. Um, yeah, athletes can go to some pretty dark places in their head, mm. falling down. I, I think there's a, a lot of the conversations on the phone are, are around like real struggles in life, right? And I, I'll try to, I probably can't bring up specifics because people might know these people. Um, but yeah, just a lot of times I'm dealing with some darkness. Mm -hmm. It's kind of showing them a lot of different strategies to draw themselves um, to move with it first. Like, let's sit with that, okay? And then let's move through that. And then we can start to rise above it. Um, whether that's kind of getting out of their head with movement, we can get so, I, I don't like sports specific programming very often, especially yeah. with my cyclists. Let's make you an athlete first. Yeah. You know, let's give you a tremendous amount of opportunities to move so that your perception, you know, how you see yourself and your abilities changes your action profile, essentially, right? So whether that's their journaling, reflective practices, a lot of my young people, for some reason, are terribly afraid to engage in breathing. Practice. Really? It's kind of weird. And I found that a lot at the University of Alabama, like we're going to breathe today. And they're like freaked out by it <laughs> just to kind of sit with their breath. Interesting. And you're going with a cyclist. So it's like, well, I mean, it's pretty important. Breathing is important. Yeah. Not all important, guys. We should probably hone in on a practice there. And so it's kind of getting them to lock in in that way. Um, so I find I find a lot of my job is to, you know, beyond the weight room, I f the power stuff, the speed and the strength is the easier part of what I do. I'm not saying it's simple. It's the easier part of what I do. But trying to feed in all these other rituals, kind of making your day into a full blown ritual, because that's the um, only thing I've found across the board with any elite athlete is they have a very ritualized day, and it's like sacrosanct the whole day. Mm -hmm. This is how I'm going to go through this. Mm -hmm. It's not this crazed obsession, but it's what they do. You know, it's, it's like it's truly a lifestyle shit. What do you, so the, there might be some people listening right now. They're like, man, what is this guy is like, I'm just, I want to get found. I want to get more Watts. I want to get stronger. I want to go deadlift. They're think they're not probably even thinking some of these things that you're talking about. But when you brought up the psychosocial aspects, something that jumped into my mind of having a recent conversation with an athlete where I simply said, why are you doing this? Why, why are yeah. you training? Why do you want to pack up your car and go to this bike race. What yep. what are we really here for? For an athlete that might not know these simplest questions to ask themselves, what do you think are some things that athletes should maybe, if they're not working with a coach, maybe just ask themselves to not or to avoid these dark places or if they find themselves in one that can start to help them unravel this ball? Because I think it's a great point that you bring up and even, it doesn't even have to be maybe a dark place, but I think that sure. you made a comment online somewhere and I'm not, I can't remember the exact comment, but the whole point was when you're just doing the same things over and over again, it leads to burnout. And we yeah, see that yeah. so much in cycling. And I think this kind of relates like a dark place, the burnout, the, I don't feel good about myself. I'm putting all this time and like, what are the, some things that can help athletes just what? question themselves in a productive manner. Huh. I, again, every elite performer I have ever seen, I don't care if they're a professor, a soldier, an elite athlete has a journaling practice mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be so specific. <laughs> Sometimes you just let it all go that ritual in and of itself like and then and then people will try to control it's like what's the question of the day mm -hmm. you know like all these different layers like i've got it i've got to know exactly what my prompt is what if you just put pen mm -hmm. to paper and you started going and you found out what your thoughts are all about and then you started to reframe them 
one practice that I really love for myself. I just share just a personal journey for me. I write from deep emotion. And a lot of times it can come from a place of anger, something I used to be fearful of. But I would write on kind of one side of my paper in my journal. I have a really big journal. I keep a, a big sketchbook. And I'll write from a place of deep emotion on one side of the paper. And then I go, well, what would it look like to reframe that as a coach, a teacher, or just for myself so that I can kind of look at this, reframe it, make it into some th something different than a place of anger or deep sadness? How can I use this? Um, one of the questions you kind of ask is like, why do I do this? Like, who do I do this for? It is some of that socialization research was just part of my background. It's like, all right, let's find out. Let's dig in. You know, the question I always ask, what do you want to do with this one precious body and this one precious life? You know, and go back to that question. A lot of times yeah, I have a friend in, in this space as well. I would call him a true healer. It's like we tend to look for that next thing. All the time. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? If it healed you, you have to keep going back to it. Like that should be part of the ritual. If it started to draw you out of the mud a little bit and allowed you to start to walk with some stability on the surface, there you go. Now that becomes a ritual practice every day. You don't just quit the breath practice, the journaling practice. Maybe you pray. Whatever mm -hmm. it is, to give you some semblance of stability and a connection with your soul, your mind, whatever you want to call it, your heart. So what do you think about, that's an interesting point of having to come back, go back to what worked. What if they then have to pivot from that? Because maybe it's not working anymore. Maybe Pattern it's- disrupt. Say that again? Pattern disrupt. Like this isn't- Yeah. I just that, you know, we could take it for a cyclist, you know, they, for whatever it was cycling, let's say six years ago, changed their life in a positive manner, but you know, maybe they're, maybe it was racing and maybe they don't get the joy from racing anymore, but they know it's cycle. Cy okay. It's cycling or maybe it's movement. Maybe it's the endorphins from an endurance activity. How do they gut check themselves a little bit or know, like, am I, do I just keep riding? Or do I, do I go to these races? Or maybe I need to go row a boat. Maybe I need to do something totally different. Huh? You know, like what's, when do you know when you need to veer off and just try, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I, don't, I, I have a hard time asking this because I don't know the answer. I don't think Brock would mind me at talking about him. Uh, okay. Brock Mason, right? Uh, I love him so much. Yeah. What an amazing human being. And just to absolute monster on the bike right mm -hmm. he took a trip to japan he basically fasts for 72 hours because he's like you know what i've fallen out of love with the game mm -hmm. and i'm gonna create a scenario i have no idea what i'm about to get into and i don't know i don't know what's gonna come out of it and he just takes himself and places himself in a totally different situation than he's used to kind of a maniac for doing it but it worked uh -huh. and he came back with sort of, sort of this restored you know love for the game to where he actually is like nine weeks out and decides to go you know <laughs> compete in the speed trials and and i love that and i find that with athletes but even just general population clients it's like let's get a little Let's go chase that thing you're kind of afraid of, man. man. You know, I've got one guy, I'm just begging him, go for a 12 mile hike because he's so afraid to be by himself. Mm. Go for a 12 mile, not a three mile. That's easy. Mm -hmm. But at sixth mile, you're going to be asking yourself a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. You know, you might cry, you might laugh. I'm not sure what's going to come up, but let's go there. You know, I think for a lot of people, especially our athletes, it's to try to get them to settle in and be still sometimes. Whether that's like go to Tai Chi, Qigong, Yin Yoga. Um, there's so many different strategies they could pursue. Like you said, I mean, play a different sport. Try pickleball. 
get back engaged with your body, you know? And I find that to be, I'm training two guys for, you know, pro football right now. And one of them's kind of outside of his body. I handed him a basketball yesterday during training. All of a sudden he had this flow and this rhythm and this coordination. And he starts to like really just, his lifts all got better. His attitude started to shift. And a, you know, he's always kind of up, but man, he just elevated to another level. Man. You know, and I think sometimes it's going back to those nostalgic places because he grew up playing basketball. Like, go there. Mm-hmm. Let's let's put that ball in your hand. What did you first fall in love with? Go there. So is it as easy as like follow your heart? Like if something feels, follow that. Isn't that a tough thing to teach? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. I mean, I think it's a. I think it's a. T- I think it's easier for me to tell someone that, but yeah. then, because of social media, am I doing that myself? And so yeah. it's maybe just do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I. It's. A, I just. Yeah. I could go. I'm like at a loss for words because I've stopped racing i would say i tell people this like athletes i'm like dude i've stopped racing like eight times and they're like what they're like you i watch you on strava and see you on instagram I'm like dude i don't talk to you about when i say f cycling and i don't want to do this anymore <laughs> um and so i think it's just you know we see what people want to put out there and not what everyone is thinking and that's just such a missed aspect of sport because there's again yeah. it's so much more than watts it's so much yeah. more yeah, I'll say well, I have an existential crisis like once a week. Like, what yeah. am I doing? What Does anyone care? <laughs> well, yeah. Does it matter? I mean, that's one thing I say. Yeah, I always like, say, hey, does this, will this matter? That's my litmus. Will this matter in five years? 99% of the time, it's no. I'm like, oh, this is great. I don't even have to worry about this. I'm going to forget about this. Yeah. What made you fear anger? Um, cause I, I mean, for, for me, it was, um, I found that when I came from a place of anger, I felt out of control. Mm. Um, I didn't understand. I have a somatic therapist now. Um, and I didn't understand what was happening to my body. So I felt out of body experience instead of like this embodied experience. Hmm. And I would kind of lose it. And I was, I was just, first of all, I've been in environments that are quite scary, violent environments. And there is this, you, this elevated, I mean, it's true fight, flight, you know, kind of flee situation. And, um, the more I was teaching her in her cities, I saw a lot of things, you know, there was too many fights to break up and, um, a level of violence that you don't want to see. Mm. Uh, Mobile can be a pretty intense place to to be. Mobile, Alabama. Um, Yeah, and I I think that some of it may stem from like childhood, misplaced anger, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a soccer player and it was very intense. I was a basketball kid too. Very aggressive. And then you lose, you know, whenever the game's over, kind of a place to place those things. Mm you know, and so it more so could come out with an intrapersonal relationship, like I'm angry with myself, or it's a projection onto your partner, your friends, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I didn't understand how to use this anger. I think people want to run, like, I don't like this emotion. It's like, yeah, I didn't like it either. But now I've learned to really use it and sit with it. Okay, where do I feel it? Where is it in my body right now? usually comes very heady okay so it's like what practices do i have whenever i'm feeling like all of this rush of blood to the head and i'm sort of clouded how can i bring myself back down you know what is that breath pattern what are the thoughts that i can consider you know that bring me back to a place of calm and stability and rootedness you know mm. To where I feel the blood actually be, you know, rushed down to the toes instead. Um, so yeah, I think a, a lot of it. Came, there's a long, there's a lot of stories of that, but yeah, nah. the fear, For, the fear is probably just being a crappy partner. Okay. Yeah. 
think yeah. a lot of people can relate to that at different points of life. For someone listening that might not know what a somatic therapist is, I had I was not familiar with this. So, and correct me if this definition from Harvard Health is not correct. Somatic therapist helps people release damaging pent up emotions in their body by using various mind body techniques. Does that sound accurate to you? Yeah, um, you know, I was diagnosed for by four different people with PTSD. I've been okay. through some real tragic kind of stuff, and and you know, person person dependent. It's very very contextual. Um, but yeah, he. Uh, she works with me to take a notice of where I feel maybe these tr- traumas. Um, and we'll even like talk to those parts of our body, which I, I bring into my strength practice. And I find I'm trying to sometimes evoke an emotion, a feeling and a sensory experience for myself and people like Brock and some of my other athletes, they can engage with that too. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we'll actually go, okay, my right hip had surgery. There were a lot of things that went on during that time as sort of this holding pattern. And if you've read The Body Keeps the Score, which I encourage everybody to read, it's a fascinating read, Um, you kind of know the body stores this sort of deep, these deep pains maybe, these traumas. And um, slowly but surely as we worked through these things and talked through them, And sometimes it was not talking at all. You know, I started to like actually see this pain leave to where I could manage my grief, talk to that grief a little bit better, right? These deep losses that I've experienced, separate the stress of being an entrepreneur from the fear that somebody's going to die. Mm -hmm. Those two were like always together, seemed like it was connected. When I'd get freaked out about my PhD, I couldn't really differentiate it from a tragic loss. Mm -hmm. It was like, these things are actually separate. Mm -hmm. This is stress of work. This is grief. And that's really what somatic therapies brought to me is like, where do you feel these deep emotions? Where do they live? Grief lives kind of sort of throat to heart. You know, anxiety lives deep in the belly for me which a lot of people with that, uh, especially those who are interested in the vagus nerve and all those things. But yeah, um, probably the greatest gift I've ever had in my life, for sure. Plus, she's a movement like freak, unbelievable mover. It's like the greatest movement artist I've ever seen. So, What makes her so great? Her flow is, on, like, she's one of the best athletes I've ever been around. Like, as far as like dancing and flowing, I mean, she's a gymnast in her own way. And there's, um, she's the most embodied person I've ever seen in my life. Just totally knows every little intimate cell. Like it's on a cellular level. I mean, she can connect in, in a way I've never been around that. Man, I've been around some incredible movement artists and strength professionals, all that stuff. You know, obviously exceptional athletes. For those who haven't seen Hayden's Instagram or like you want to see a ripped dude flowing, like that's you you he posts some of these things and that's when I was like, Wow, this this cat is on some different different movement, I guess. Um and you had said something that I had a question about and then we just started talking about this woman. But <laughs> you know, I'd I had reached out to I know probably a small handful of your athletes and I won't name this person, but I said, hey, so what what attracted you to Hayden? And I just want to, I think this might be an interesting way to to open up the conversation about your strength practice, because that's what's, you know, some people who strength is, is getting more popular in cycling, but for some reason our sport is convinced that you don't need to be a strong athlete to produce a lot of watts, which I have a hard yeah. time understanding in my brain. But yeah. this athlete said, Instead of someone simply programming different weights and machines, I knew his knowledge of physical movement and how it combines with life and soul was going to be much deeper. I was more interested in restoring natural movement, firing patterns, increasing my mobility, and building a greater conscious physical connection to my body. Training to to squat more or be more explosive is elementary stuff compared to the rest of his knowledge. 
as he will tell you, training should be a playful, soulful experience, which I unknowingly was seeking. And oh yeah, I got way stronger too. So, so I was like, uh, and that's kind of the, when I just started to look through the stuff you put out online, I was like, okay, this, this kind of matches up with what I'm, the vibe I'm getting. But so what is strength to you? Like how athlete XYZ comes to you, like y'all want to get stronger, dude. Where do you start with that? <laughs> okay <laughs> i will i'm just gonna say this i will live the rest of my life trying to answer what is strength okay what is like, tr- okay what is strength? like it's it's always going to be a fascinating question for me like why what is strength what does it mean to be strong and and i told you like <laughs> i try to take an ecological approach because strength can live in so many different ways but if we're talking about the physical domain um you know, there's there's some baseline practices if you want to talk about that. Um, regarding well, on like, August eighth, twenty twenty four, what is strength to you? Yeah, where where is the definition at today? Yes. Um, for the for the cyclists, it's more of like developing strength that will create power, right? Mm-hmm. Um, with strength. I think a lot of times what I'm dealing with, with any of my athletes is just more of an intimate knowledge of their body first to get them to be able to produce an unbelievable amount of force. So strength is very neural, you know, we are dealing with neural drive, neuromuscular efficiency and trying as that quote said, like those firing patterns that you're searching for um you know i'm trying not to give you this like standard definition of strength because anybody can look up strength i'm trying to kind of give you more of like an approach where i think strength has to live within play first you know giving you a lot of movement options maybe in a warm-up situation where you're starting to feel that flow, that rhythm, that timing, that coordination. You got a little bit of bounce. You got a little bit of flow. You're understanding your body, where it is in space. A lot of people will say, this is proprioception training. I see this a lot in the cycling space. It's all proprioceptive, guys. You cannot move your foot without it being proprioceptive training. But let me pause you there just because I don't think everyone's going to know that. And correct me if I'm wrong. Proprioception is I close my eyes. I know where my hand is right now in space. Yeah. yeah. Vestibular is obviously dealing with like the ears and the eyes. And I, you can train that. And, you know, if you want to have an intimate knowledge of that, then I'm probably not your guy. Okay. Um, and just, and, and man, you're going to know so much more than myself and 99.5% of our listeners. So when you have a basic... It's probably not basic to us, so don't feel like you're going to give us something too elementary. But I, yeah. so when you said that, I'm like laughing to myself. I'm like, because I don't think everybody listening, I know everybody listening to this podcast has no idea that the brain has something to do with what we can learn. Well, so when, like when you're talking about the neurological side, it's going to be like, yeah, I, I think well, maybe maybe it's good to, you know, again, anybody on this podcast can look up like what is strength. Okay, you're going to be able to deal with that, but. What a lot of times I think I'm afraid of within the cycling community and soccer is they think strength means getting jacked out of your skull. Like you just like, you're just shredded, ripped, you become a bodybuilder, right? So that's the worry. That's the worry. That's the worry, right? And I laugh. You can develop strength without gaining a single pound. Man. Because it is so new. How is that possible? Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Because you're just, there's, there's certain protocols that you're training. Right. There's certain, there's very basic principles that we're working alongside. You, I, you're probably never going to have, and, and through hypertrophy research, there's this, there's so many people fighting about this right now. Your sets and rep schemes, they can be so broad within like the development of tissue and making mm-hmm. it larger. Let's say that. Mm-hmm. Whether it's four repetitions up to 30. But then, um, but yeah, I mean, with strength, with strength principles, what you're dealing with here is you're trying, you're usually going to ask somebody to perform two to four very high quality reps 
with a specific load that's usually going to at least be above like 80% of their one rep max. And not the biggest fan of programming rate of perceived exertion because I don't think a lot of people understand what a 10 out of 10 in the weight room feels like. Mm -hmm. My cyclists definitely know what 10 out of 10 on the bike feels like. Mm -hmm. So within my app, or if they're with me in person, I program a range. And this is what this is why I like the velocity based training in a sense, where I give them four to six repetitions, maybe it's gonna be like five to six sets, four to six repetitions at eighty to eighty seven percent. Cause on any given day your one hundred percent might change. Like your ability to produce force might shift. Mm -hmm. So as long as I give them these kind of ranges, they're able to have some agency over their training that day. And we're still achieving these strength outputs that will flip and become more of these power outputs on the bike. Now we can start to kind of get in the weeds with like, what is strength? Where is, you know, absolute strength. I think a lot of times people think because they're grinding out a very slow rep, that's going to make them slow. That can't be the case. There's high threshold motor units that are firing so rapidly, regardless of how slow that lift is. Um, and so again, it's just, it can be very, very neural and I'm rarely chasing like a weight gain with anybody, especially in cycling. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've always told people, I'm like, if you went up to someone who's jacked in the gym and tell them you're going to get bulky from lifting two times a week, they're going to laugh at you. Like it's not easy well, it, to get jacked. You have to be so intentional about it as well. I don't think most cyclists can afford to get jacked. Mm. In it, terms of energy or time? Energy, time, cost to eat that much. Mm. Like you have to shift your diets even more. I mean, y'all are already having to take in so many calories on any given day. It's like if we're going to get intentional about gaining weight, man, you know, I... Not all my cyclists are very wealthy boys and girls. <laughs> <laughs> what can you get strong or strength? And I know now I'm like hesitant to use that word um, by doing higher reps and low weight. Or when people hear you say two to four to six reps, does it always have to be that lower rep range at uh, 80 to, you know, 90 percent one rep max? If we're talking about like... If, if so, if we're dealing with like, it's usually like the the buckets are neural versus structural. Okay. Um, can you create like structural or like muscle tissue adaptations to eventually get to the neural stuff? Yeah, you can. Do you should you operate with high rep light loads like I see a lot of times in the cycling community? Probably not. If you're a beginner, it does not matter. Hmm. Like it probably does. You could take chat GPT's program, run it, and you're going to get stronger more than likely. I don't care what program is. Mm. Like if you've never been in the weight room before, hundred mm percent. -hmm. But if you're an intermediate, you have some experience, there's gotta be pretty specific principles, protocols put in place to develop actual strength adaptations. Cool. That should transfer to, that dynamic correspondence transfer to sport is interesting. Sometimes it can be an unknown quantity. Like we're not exactly sure, even if it looks so specific to your sport, if it's going to transfer because of you as a human being, the environment that day, the changing task, depending on, you know, we just watched a kid, um, hit a 1500 meter race three second PR because he had to, mm -hmm. you know, so we're never sure what might happen on like a race day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, there's so many things in that, uh, the, the Olympics have been wild. Mm -hmm. What's, um, so can you talk about the firing patterns a little bit more and how is that something, this is very, 
sailing to my brain because I've been having an issue with my glutes and I hear people being like, oh, well, you know when your glutes are firing. And I think most athletes, especially newer athletes, don't know how to tap in. Like, wait, how do I know what's firing? And what, when I just say, you know, firing patterns, what does that mean to you? So, um, <clears throat> you're, when you're talking about like firing patterns, it's just really thinking about your body's ability um, to efficiently move through whatever pattern it's taking on, right? That you're going to have to have a tremendous amount of reps within that pattern. You know, I think that a lot of people kind of give up maybe a movement and strength practice a little too soon, um, you know, but over time, it's more just an exposure to patterns um, so that your soft tissue, your tendons, your ligaments, your joints kind of understand what to do as well as starting to deal with, you know, the muscles and, and what they, what they're supposed to do. What is the agonist and the antagonist working as they should, you know, when I'm dealing with a concentric load, am I asking too much of this particular area when I need to be mm -hmm. training or something else, right? I think a lot of times when you're really new, let's say with a squat, some people's like adductor magnus gets strained pretty early um, because their quads don't exactly know how to take on that load yet. And so they ask a lot of maybe like the things that are proximal, like close to the body um, instead of maybe kind of more like distal or, you know, like your vastus, that beautiful teardrop, that quadricep muscle, mm. um, your DMO. Um, and it can all, it can all be so different. And so it's more of just a motor learning approach with firing patterns. It's like continuously giving somebody repetitions. I like Bernstein's work with 67, 1967 research where it's like repetition without repetition. You give people a lot of different constraints. So if y'all, if, if your people follow me, I'm visiting a split squat right now. Like I'm obsessed with it. I'm mm -hmm. using varying tools with varying tempos and varying loads within a split squat. So sometimes it may be the knee is over the toe. <clears throat> sometimes it's a vertical shin angle where it's 90 degrees. Sometimes it's a negative shin angle. And I'm honing in and I would love more athletes to engage with this process of going, let's go as slow as we can throughout each repetition take notice of what is firing try to hone in on that area you don't have to know the name of the muscle mm -hmm. just know where it is take your time up and down and i like to do it more from a prompt space it's like do till failure or do until you're bored you know a lot of time so it's more just really learning with firing power it's just like learning what my body's capable of what can be tense what can relax you know, you go from there. This is interesting. I feel like I'm having two podcasts at once. We had a, uh, I don't know if you know, glute dopers online, but, uh, it's yeah, these I've guys seen. I'm work. Yeah. And that was one of the exercises. They said, go ride it. This watt, this watt, this watt. And just let me know what's fire, what's lighting up and what's activated. And yeah. as very I think interesting practice. About firing patterns, it's like, it's more of, this is where it kind of, it's a qualitative approach in a sense. Like I don't have, you know, if you're, if you're at a really wonderful, like sports science facility, they can put different technology on you to show you what's firing. Like that, that exists. We don't Is that have just like a patch or something on the outside of your body. Yeah. It can be like nodes and stuff like that. I know the university of Alabama has these kind of different tools, um, that they can put on the athletes to read, uh, what's going on. Nobody has that, you know? that mm. we're talking to right now so then it becomes like you're dealing with these with these people they're asking you it's like where do you feel it and a lot of it is that like there has to be a qualitative approach to this i ask that in between sets all the time where did you feel that and it's always pretty interesting when they don't feel it where they're supposed to mm -hmm. and you're like okay this is where, you know, maybe your listeners don't know about like a constraints led approach. It's like, okay, I've got to change the task. I, cha I can't change the individual. 
and I may need to change the environment or I may need to ask them to think about a muscle really hard and tune in. It may be as simple as changing the joint angle. It may be as simple as changing the bar. You know, that's the beauty of my facility is I've got so many different bar options, safety squat bar. My favorite thing to do with all athletes is a zercher squat where they're holding the bar in their elbows, which looks a heck of a lot like getting on a bike, rounding yourself over the handles and going as hard as you possibly can, right? Um... So that's a lot of times it's just really changing the task to get them to, to feel where I want them to feel it and hopefully create the adaptation there. So I'm okay with you saying yes to this. If it's true, I tried the zercher and I was trying front squats. Am I just too much of a baby that it didn't feel great? Like I just couldn't like this hurt up here and this like was just super awkward. And I don't know if I was doing it wrong, but I'm like, I'm just going to do back squat. This is like awkward. Is that a normal First yeah, no, it's extremely normal. That's why I give the Zercher squat the first day. I don't care if you're 55 years old and you're a gardener or you're 15 years old. It's like the first thing we do with a bar. Because uh, it is one of those, like, don't be soft. Yeah. It really is. And I I try to be, like, such a gentle, like, beautiful soul. You know, and I love, I love that, right? But sometimes it's like, dude, this sucks. I get it. But I've also got friends and myself as well that do this at 400 to 500 pounds. So your body will adapt. I just don't even know how that's possible. That's so crazy. And it's a technical thing too, you know, and again, we're dealing with like firing patterns. It's like some people don't know how to wrap their lats around it, right? They Mm -hmm. don't know how to get this, the scapular protraction, Mm -hmm. huge recycling. Being able to get kind of rounded and tight over something. That's where that zercher can come into play. And you're just wrapping those lats. You're wrapping into this position where you're really rounded. You know, you do have that thoracic and cervical flexion. You are asking your lumbar to get into deep kind of flexion. And a lot of people fear a flex sort of rounded spot. But it puts you in this really beautiful, advantageous position to create tremendous amount of strength maybe power but likely you loaded it too heavy or you're just not used to it and you're gonna numb out just like rock climbers fingers do Mm. (laughs) yeah i i think also too i was yeah well we won't go into it because i had like really bad squat technique and i think that partly played into it um with the front squat but so you're like, so you're thinking about like front squat, arms crossed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just never well, get comfortable. Like I, I felt like I was choking myself. I, yeah. I tried this, but it felt my elbows never stayed this way. And I'm trying to remember what I did. I don't think it was overloaded. I put on like no weight, which is what made, I was like, what am I doing wrong? This is my technique. I know my technique was terrible, but I was at a gym where I didn't know anybody and which was fine. So if I look like a total doofus, I was cool with that. And just couldn't get comfortable with it i kept thinking this is why am i struggling with this so much but yeah if i go back to it i'll i'll take more mental notes on that yeah no i I, with the with the front squat i think it just depends um you know going to let's say if you look at a cycling coach like toby edwards and what he deals with with the you know these athletes that are just training like really you know like the velodrome stuff all that right Mm -hmm. Like those athletes probably they need the they need to develop a really good front squat because he's gonna have them do an Olympic lifts. You know. We can develop similar and if not this the same power profile without ever doing that. But once you get to a level where you've gotta be that Greek god on a bike, things might start to shift. But those those people are are experts in a weightlifting in a powerlifting standpoint and a lot of the people that are listening to this don't have to be Mm -hmm. right and so again it's like offering them a lot of different movement problems to create a similar adaptation so you know a back squat is going to be very different than a front squat on the way you're like leveraging your body 
you know, mm-hmm. and, and what might fire. But if that feels good to you and you feel confident with that, I don't have time for you to feel sometimes, especially if we're lifting in season, like you're not good enough. Like you don't know if you're doing it right. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think um, that you brought up some good aspects of just, I can't remember the word you exactly used, but how we're taking the strength and putting it on the bike where we need to be able to still put out these wa- it's great if you can squat you know 800 pounds but if you can actually then get in an arrow position and crush the pedals and maintain that uh you know was it really worth it and right. i can't remember the exact word that you used but like applying it to the bike dynamic correspondence is yeah. is way we kind of talk about it or some people would call it transfer to sport okay um which is really difficult you want to treat the weight room as a general physical preparation environment. I am Dang. under no illusion that, like, I'm not teaching you race craft. Mm-hmm. You're a craftsman. You're an artist. You're in flow. You're seeing things. If you're great at what you do, no matter what sport, you're seeing, this is that perception and action stuff. You're perceiving things no one else can see. You might find a line no one else saw. That doesn't happen in the weight room. I think it can happen through skill acquisition a little bit, exposing you to a lot of different things maybe you've never tried before, which oftentimes for me would come through warm-up situations, maybe even just begging of you to go try a different sport. A lot of my cyclists, your feet and your ankles are total crap. Mm-hmm. Well, um, and your gastroc and soleus do matter. Like your calf muscles matter. You know, Mm -hmm. that does come into play with the biomechanics of pedaling down, you know, being able to create the right amount of stiffness and elasticity in the Achilles tendon um, comes into play. So can we play a little bit more, maybe volleyball, things like that to just get you jumping and and getting in that kind of playful spirit to where when you get on that bike, you either, you're you even more in tune with who you are as an athlete and a person. You know what you're capable of. Yeah, you bring up a great point that uh, PT said to me, you've been in this stiff shoe for literally over 200,000 miles. I guarantee you've lost some of your ability to do anything when your heel is raised and you're on your toes. I'm like, really? He said, yeah, go do these rows, put a split squat, go up on the balls of your feet. And I was like, oh my God, whoa, this is way harder. And this is only 35 pounds. What is going on? He's like, dude, we'll we'll get you there. And yeah, just some of the strength that has come back in different aspects. I've, yeah, this wasn't a problem when I was three years in, but now 200,000 miles later, I'm like, oh wow, I've really just been riding a lot. So it's been a very eye-opening process for myself. Yeah. Um. I want to respect your time. I got two two more questions for you. Uh, one of the things you had said somewhere was that you only know what you know at the moment. And you sort of chuckled and said you had regrets from coaching. What are some of the things that you've learned over the years that you look back and you're like, oh my God, what was I thinking at that point in time? Or Or maybe ask differently, what's been the biggest aspect of growth from yourself as a coach? I just, no, that was a massive question, brother. Yeah. Ooh, I love that question. Regrets I have as a coach was trying to take on somebody else's personality as a coach. Um, but you have to try on a lot of different hats. And Meaning you're me- like a, someone that was helping you being a mentor and you were trying to coach like, like they coach? observations of other coaches. Okay. Where... Um, as a captain of a soccer team, like, you know, I was center back and I would I would dictate sort of what was going on on the pitch a lot of times. And I, we weren't reliant on the coach to do that. And a lot of times as a coach, I would try to dictate what was going on when I needed to give the, the game and the craft to the athlete. That was a, probably a big eye-opener for me was and something that I'll, you'll, if you work with me as a strength performance coach, um, 
I, I am of the belief most people are visual and kinesthetic learners first. You don't need a ton of verbal cues a lot of times. You don't need somebody in your ear. I don't need to offer you all of these different instructions. If you get on my app, you're not going to find a five minute tutorial. Like I need you to move first. I need you to discover and explore. If you don't look like me, so what? I'm a master of this particular craft. You're a master of your craft. You know, so I think it was, for me, it was a humbling experience to realize, you know, most of my athletes have answers that I could never have, you know, I wouldn't be able to answer it in that way. Mm. And that's where, you know, I became more obsessed with like the, you know, a constraints led sort of skill acquisition approach or like there's so many different angles. If this particular, like you don't like the Zercher squat, but I really want you to load in a similar way, I can find another solution for that initially. And then we'll eventually get there. Um, and so it really was just like letting an athlete dictate what was going on. Let athlete, athlete be quiet a lot of time. I think great coaches are quiet and they ask very simple questions. They know how to ask very simple questions to elicit great answers a lot of times. Um, so yeah, for me, my coaching journey was, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes as far as just talking too much. And I've made a lot yeah. of mistakes in terms of talking about things I didn't have expertise in. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so it's kind of deferring out, you know, even maybe in the cycling community, it's like, there's probably some people that are great cycling coaches that try to become weight room guys. They mm -hmm. might want to partner up with a friend, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. which is what I would more prefer to do from a cycling. It's like, I'm an expert here in this movement, education, strength, performance. Let somebody else take over football guys. I think it's a big mistake. A lot of those people make is like, you're trying to resolve problems that that's that position coach can solve better than you ever could. Let them do that. Let them do that work. Know your role, know what your expertise is and let the other experts take over. Yeah. I think some people, it's very easy as a cyclist to forget that strength is a sport in itself. Lifting weights is a different sport and as we tell people, like, we're happy to give you recommendations. We're happy, but I'm like, things change. What works for you is not going to work for somebody else. Like you need to get in the gym and like explore a little bit and people feel differently from different things. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, y'all are really, you know, the, again, kind of going back to firing and strength. It's like, you want to get with somebody that understands like motor unit action potentials and how these like repeated muscle contractions may be able to feed into your sport. I mean, that's really what a firing pattern is. I try not to speak over people's heads too much, but that's, that's what you're chasing is like somebody that understands how to dose appropriately with mm -hmm. that. And they've already done all of that work and they're the masters of that particular craft. Mm -hmm. No. What's then my last question would be, so, and we kind of, kind of started this a little bit before, but how, how do, how does the process go? Somebody is resonating with what you're talking about and trying to connect and wants to get, be a better cyclist, we'll say, not even get stronger. Um, how, how do you want them to connect with you to start a conversation? And then what's it like, I mean, people that might follow some of these athletes that there are, how do I say this? There are cyclists, the cyclists that you coach, they tag you all the time. So they're doing what to a lot of cyclists looks like different lifts, different movements, whatever. How does that all come together if someone uh, starts working with you? I guess better way for me to ask this question, I'm, I'm kind of struggling with it. What's it like to work with you? They're a cyclist, they want to get better. What's the overlap when they're working with Coach Hayden? Um, my business model isn't, uh, perfect. I'll say that. Um, I yeah. prefer, I was doing, I'll say this. I was doing more of a template 
and kind of like buy program, do program. And I didn't feel myself in that yet. There may come a day where that feels good to me, where I offer templates. Um, but with, with the cyclists, a lot of times I'm dealing with someone really doesn't understand their body off of the bike. Yeah. I've had a couple that are multi-sport athletes that I feel comfortable having more of a lower price point. I build program. We have a conversation once a month and then we move on. Okay. Sometimes there needs to be more of an intensive and a mentorship approach with this. And so sometimes it is, well, you can call it a biopsychosocial model if you want to, but you know, these are more like these deeper connections, kind of 24 seven access, voice texts, videos, whatever it needs to be, these long form conversations that are building a lifestyle to support performance on the bike. You know, and that would be more of, that's an expertise that I have is to be able to help you develop a true lifestyle around it. Um, and to not, not try to major in the minors, right? There's a lot of, I see uh-huh. that a lot in the endurance space. They get obsessed with so many little different things, but they're not taking care of some of the big rocks, right? Man, no. It's wild to me that soccer is still a similar way as cycling, like where people are so afraid to go lift weights, you Mm. know? And if you are working with me, it's very important that you stay in this year long. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go in the weight room for 60 minutes. You can have a practice as simple as something I do every single morning is I jump an extensive plyo, like a jump rope a hundred times. Mm-hmm. Just to feed that Achilles and that elasticity and kind of get that balance. And then you need to probably lift like once a week while you're in season. If you can get there twice a week, great. Mm-hmm. So it may look like strength power output. And a lot of times it's going to be joint specific, soft tissue care. So I want to know that your spine is healthy and your hips are rocking. And so it give you little microdosed movements like that. One of my cyclists, he finally did it. He's like, oh my God, my hips feel like butter. I was like, dude, I've had this on your program for a year. He's like, I feel so good. I was like, yeah, I've been trying. I really yeah. want you to do that. So if somebody's working with me, I'll let you know. Like I over-program and I give you the option and I try my best to hold you accountable, but no one can motivate you like you, you know? I love to hear you say that because we, we try to – tell athletes that they need to take ownership of their training. We can help you in many ways, but we can't do it. And we don't, we can't insert the drive to wake up and go perform. And if you don't have that, then there's, we need to go back to the beginning of this conversation, asking yourself these questions. Why are you doing this? Why are you here? Because right. you don't need this from me. This is, there's something else that you need to suss out and, and figure out. But no, it's awesome, man. It sounds, I, I love that in my PT, I'd ask him like, do I have to do this part of the exercise that I wouldn't have put it there if it wasn't important? I said, I love you, dude. So that, that's such a spicy response, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> any, any final words, man? This is, um, I love just, you know, I'm, I'm excited to follow along more and just learn more about you, but this was a really good way to kind of open the book for other people as well. And any kind of parting words or things that we didn't touch on? Yeah, I mean, apologies for not like speaking so specific to like the science behind like strength and stuff. I I know that, you know, there can be a lot of confusion about that. Um, So I would invite people to just observe, you know, what strength can be um, and to have a real curiosity about that, Um, you know, and and that I I'll say that a lot of times I find my endurance athletes, whether it's my elite soldiers or ultra runners, things like that, often overdose in the endurance part of it and underdose in kind of the strength and power. And that you don't have to do a whole lot in that weight room space to keep delivering gains to yourself. And the thing with the strength and the power, the speed practice from a weight room environment is at the end of the day, you're probably going to level up your watts 
more than likely you do. And every single one of my guys and girls does, but it's the consistency of performance that they all talk about that a lot of times they already kind of had these great power numbers, but what the training does is give you that consistency and performance, even when you don't feel good, that's where that firing patterns, the strength and that power all comes into play where you may be having kind of a rough day and you didn't recover well, but that stuff's there and your body knows what it's capable of. Part of it's just a confidence thing, man. So hopefully, I love that. Hopefully people can take that and roll with that. Awesome. Hayden, thank you so much. Uh, everybody, we're going to post the book that he recommended, his Instagram, reach out with questions if you're curious about coaching. Good luck with your training, racing, strength, whatever that means. And we'll talk to y'all soon.